Hello and welcome to our podcast, How to Stay Married So, so far. far in brackets. Welcome if you're listening to us or welcome if you're watching us on YouTube. I'm very tired because it was the election last night. Yeah. And I didn't stay up all night. I didn't need to because the result was clear. Um, people passed. don't like us preambling and chatting away, so let's cut to the chase. Not everybody quickly. does. Not I, everybody. I, you know, I don't. I don't like that cheap pre-chat, chit-chat nonsense. Okay, get on with it then. Anyway, what did you go up to last night? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is about the, the, what they just romance and relationships, and when they start, there is a new trend and an increasing trend in this land of what they call romantic realism to have what they call pre marriage counselling. Can we just pause for one second? Mm. Romantic realism. Romantic realism. That almost seems like an oxymoron. It doesn't it? <laughs> but as we get older, we realise that it's not an oxymoron. It is a thing. When I... you're young, you just think love should just be love. You shouldn't have to think about it. You shouldn't have to talk about it. You shouldn't have to uh, worry or, or be counselled in any way about it. If you really love somebody, it's all going to work out just fine yeah. on its own. Yeah, absolutely. And as I read this piece about more and more people having pre marriage counselling, I had two tugs, tugs of, well, I had a tug of war. This is basically an article marked discovered yeah. in the Guardian. Was a tug of war that pulled me in two contrary directions. On the one hand, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, my head was going, oh, that's quite a good, sensible thing. As a parent, oh yeah, I want my kids to kind of enter into meaningful relationships. So that was one part of me. And then another part of me thought, how fucking boring. How ridiculous. How, how can you clip a... something that's so unmanageable, which is love? How can we... It feels like, I do think sometimes there's a danger that we're trying to straitjacket every emotion we feel into a beautifully conceived and executed and behaved, you know, well-behaved thing. You're talking like a teenager. What do you mean? With, with him, which is what, it's, it is strange. I mean, we, we the, the young get knocked so much at the moment, don't yeah. they? But this idea that there is this real rise in young people going and taking courses and yeah. having counselling sessions yeah. before they get married because Absolutely. they want to work out all the stuff and they're more mm. nervous. They've seen generation after generation as marriage collapsing in divorce and, mm. they want, and they want to think about it differently. I mean, in this particular article that we both read, there was a couple talking that had been together eight years mm -hmm. and they talked about how they had this incredible connection when they first met, mm. um, which certainly we, we had, mm. and the whole soulmate thing and... Um, great communicators and then eight years into their relationship they decided they wanted to get married yeah. and thought okay well let's go and get some counseling to see if we can find our way back we still love each other obviously mm. we still want to be with each other mm. but so much gets in the way of that like soulmate romantic mm. like yeah we just communicate yeah whatever you say it doesn't matter oh yeah you've left your pants on the floor i don't mm. mind and as the counsellor in the article says, that's because oxytocin, the love hormone, is going like crazy and just covers over all the cracks, the little cracks that, that we don't want to see or need to see. Mm. And so reading that article, I thought, my God, these people are incredibly smart to do this. And actually it made me feel a bit envious of what happens when you come out of counselling as a couple. And I think they talk in there about, uh, in the article about how they wanted to find like a safe space to be able to talk to each other again. You know, he noticed that early on in the morning he would say something critical to her, she would then suppress it and then mm. it would cause a distance. And they discovered that if they chose to talk around dinner time, they put a particular time to talk about then. If, and I was like, yes, this is really good. This is really good. And yes, and maybe if Mark had uh, had done this right at the beginning of our relationship, we would have had a better relationship. But... With all of the hindsight that we have, and with the fact that we've experienced really good counselling and da-da-da, I still don't think I would say, and honestly, I know some people say, God, now you're contradict contradicting yourself, because I have touched on this in other podcasts, where I've said, you know, I think now, if we could have gone for counselling before we got married, it would have been good. I've changed my mind. I, I, I don't actually think I would have done that, because I think... When you are really enjoying the oxytocin and just the mad rush of love where you would just allow everything to go, it's actually a really nice time. And actually, I don't think I would want to then sit down and work out every detail of how, how it might go wrong and what to do. Wow. Well, for saying I found the article, you've just completely read told me the entire article. That's everything. That's everything. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. I mean, you're right. I mean, insofar as my, my hunch with the, with the article was, was that it was incredibly sensible. 
Yes. It all just felt incredibly sensible. And it's the right thing to do. And it all felt incredibly correct. Yes. And, and I kept finding myself being tugged towards, yes, that makes sense, and yes, that's reasonable. And then it reminded me of relationships I despise. Yeah. And then it made me think, hang on a minute. You know, and it really, really threw me on the back foot, actually, because of course I'm balanced. And I, the reason I thought I'd bring this up for one of our marriage podcasts is I do think sometimes we lose track of the fact that a lot of people listen to these and watch these who are at the early stage of relationships or aren't in relationships and are thinking about how they want to conduct themselves in a meaningful relationship later in life. And God forbid they look to us for some kind of inspiration or guidance, dare I say, or at least, you know, shared experiences about what pitfalls you can try and avoid. And I was thinking, well, yeah, on paper, my advice to say any of my adult children now, like Izzy and Fleur, and, and increasingly as Maddie comes through, would be, yeah, observe all these things, because I want to protect them emotionally. I want to ensure that there's a sort of continuity to their lives and that they're not taken advantage of and that everything... And then, and then I keep trundling along this route. And then like you, and I guess this is what you're kind of saying in a very sort of, much more sort of strangely academic way that you were saying it, is that I don't think I'd have wanted... If, if that had been my route to now, what the hell would I be? Now, it's like if you have that amount of management, mm. emotional management at the front, are you in danger of, 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 of in, in a sense, spreadsheeting your marriage to such a... I mean, this is from the couple who were pregnant in three months and married in six. No, 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 absolutely. I think there's, I so think I there's, think we were the there's a happy extreme, medium. There's a happy well, medium. And there's, and there's obviously, there's a, there's a chart and a range of kind of different levels within that range. But... I sort of, I did end up sort of thinking, well, where's the, where's the unpredictability? Where's the, where's the unknowability of the heart? Where's the, not okay, you know, is, is romance, I mean, what did they call it? Romantic realism. realism. I, I go back to this idea, isn't that a contradiction in well, terms? The, the, one of the interesting things that it says in the article as well is that it's not just a seven year, it's just 12 years. Yeah. 12 years is the time when people really crack up. <clears throat> we had a really difficult time, I think, and we 12 did. years. Yeah, we did. We did, actually. Mm. Yeah, I wanted and to run for the pills. Yeah, me too. And I think that, I think that that's interesting. And I think maybe, maybe if I had my time again, you know, like they have counselling in church, in, if you're religious, don't mm. you? That, 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 I think it's a Catholic church, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. That you go for a counselling with the oh. priest. Um, and maybe what, maybe there is something to be taken from that in that you don't go into the minute of your relationship, but you take the big questions. Mm. What are your thoughts on children and how you bring them up? Yeah. What are your da da da? Maybe there is like, maybe there's the top four. I mean, what if you were thinking now, what do you think are the four things that people should really discuss that they don't because in the first throes of love? I would say first children, How? what are your views on how you're bringing up children? We've, we've touched on that in other, Podcast because we've always said, haven't we? We never discussed that mm. before we had children. I mean, I'd seen you with your girls, mm. my stepdaughters, and I'd loved the way you were with them, and so that informed me, I suppose. But um, I don't know. I suppose things like apparently what a lot of people fall out on is holidays. People want completely different things. They see well, I think, themselves no, I think, in their downtime in a completely different way. Well, I think one of the major I think, I think one of the major problems. I, I do. You can't. Again, it goes back to this thing of you can't micromanage human emotions. If you do that in any way, it's a recipe for disaster. You're going to blow. So, in a sense, okay. So holidays. Well, what's a broader term for holidays? How you spend your downtime. Mm. Or how you spend your leisure time. And you see, you are getting into the minute. Aren't what are you, you? Well, no, the minute is holidays. Because it evolves. I mean, the way that we, when we spend time together, it evolves around what we Well, I mean, a small, a small example is this morning. I'm, I'm in a much slower, lower, I've just noticed a huge leak on our ceiling as well. There's a, we're in a much slower and, and lower um, energy level. And there are times where you can't, you know, we couldn't sit down and I couldn't say to you with any, with any, reasonableness 
can you just not be like, quite like that? Because actually, it kind of that's not my energy at the moment. If you're around each other, you just can't do that. And you know, so everyone should have their own room. Well, everyone should have their Don't own have room. Don't have an open plan house. But at the same time, you know. So I think, how do you talk about that? What do you do? Do you sit down and say, "Oh, well, I'll be." Suddenly, my problem with all of this is that you start to sort of iron out. And I think that's why a lot of people have such a sniffy attitude to counselling in general. It's like, how can you? That's why counselling generally, and the the reason this is quite a big thing about pre-marriage counselling is counselling usually is a sort of reaction to. A a problem there's been some trauma in the relationship there's been an, a lack of it might be you know the trauma might have been growing for a while but it'd be a lack of intimacy a lack of communication an affair uh, violence whatever it, it might be there'll be all those kind of things and um, usually counseling is a way to kind of repair Mm. Potentially, mm. Uh, I suppose this is a discussion about why why do we always wait till we're firefighting mm. rather than predicting that there's. I think exactly. I think, I think acknowledging that strike. there's a distance. Okay, we're not talking <clears> about <throat> you know really toxic situ situations where there is violence mm. or abuse or, mm. or you know um, mental torture or, or whatever. That's a very separate thing. But I think, and I've brought this up many times in, in our podcast, that I really do think, because I see it as a treat, actually, counselling. I think that it's like, it's like a time of growth. Mm. It's fascinating. You know, what's making you tick? What's making your partner tick? And I, and I think it would be really good for us to, to, to go into marriage guidance counselling again, because we're not going in firefighting, mm. which we have done in the past, where we've gone in and I've gone you've thought, I can't stay with this woman another minute, and I've thought, I just can't do this anymore. That's a very sad and very scary place when you go into marriage counselling in that state. But when you go like we would be, preemptively, like I think both of us um, are quite paranoid. I think we're both chippy. I think we've both got to that place where if one says something to the other one, it's immediately like... So we're doing that thing where we're avoiding saying stuff because it's like, how's she going to take it? How's he going to take it? And that's just a, that's just a mismatch of communication. I, I, I'd give this bit of advice, right? Because from the counselling that we've had, and I know I've said this before in other podcasts, so do bear with me. The best bit of advice, practical advice we ever got, what do you think it is? Have a clue. Oh my God. Was when you set the timer for five minutes and you just talk. Yeah. Because you stop, we all stop listening mm. to each other. Mm. And so if you haven't got the money or you haven't got the time or if you haven't got the... This is what most counselling comes down to. Set a timer for five minutes. Do not interrupt. We tried to do it a few weeks ago and it was so funny. We didn't get past a minute. Well, you do not interrupt <clears throat> at all. You don't say a single word and you just let the other person talk. Then you don't have to answer them. You don't have to go, well, you said this. You can just talk about something completely different. Mm. And that is really the root of all problems in a relationship. Well, they do say that the top thing uh, that I've got a very sort of psycho uh, an analytical and marital counselling sort of website say that the top reason for pre-marriage counselling is precisely to teach you and to learn how to talk to each other. Mm. Because, of course, the thing is how to talk to each other, how to talk to each other, is as much about how to listen to each other as it is about how to talk to each oh, other. God, yeah. Because, you know, you can talk, 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 but, you you know, we've been there in rows, you've probably been there, guys. You know, you sit there and you go, all right, yeah, talk, and you're just standing there thinking, right, I'm just formulating what the fuck I'm going to say, because actually I entirely disagree with your entire attitude, everything you said and nothing, it's all going to be self-serving and all that kind of stuff. It isn't just about giving you yourself your five minutes because that five minutes can just become an opportunity just to say everything you want to say and not listen. Mm. You know, it's as much about listening as it is about talking to each other. And I think it's funny, it's weird, isn't it? I don't really know what the subject of this, this podcast is as we're talking because it's sort of shifting all over well, the place. Well, I think, I think we're talking about, you know, having been 16 years in marriage, mm. it's interesting that there is this rise in young people wanting mm, to go for this counseling. For, and what would we, what would we, what would we do as our younger selves? But if we'd gone into pre-marriage counselling, we wouldn't have got married. I was going to say we probably wouldn't have stayed together because the no. other problem that you discover it's is very hard when you start digging that stuff up. Well, because one of the other things that pre-marriage counselling is about is about finding out why you chose each other. Why did we choose each other? And, and, you know, when you start to look into that sort of stuff, you'll probably find, and this goes back to this idea that, you know, we're a family that's impacted by uh, alcoholism and addiction. It goes back to this idea that actually a lot of couples come together due to their dysfunctionality and their 
unsuitability for each other. And that unsuitability can be hidden through behaviour and sort of lust and sex and alcohol and hedonism. Mm. And then once you start to... And what I think is a pretty common pattern with most relationships is once that ebbs away... And isn't it funny how an alcoholic community describes really the honeymoon period as about being off your tits for most of that period until you kind of go, well, I can't keep doing this all the time, otherwise I'm going to die. Mm. And then at the point that you say, all right, well, I need to settle down a bit more and be a bit more normal, you look but, at but what you've Mark, got and you, you go... But, saying that, you've got to remember, not everybody is like that. Well, no, but I think... I'm, no, I'm being... <laughs> Lots of people have nice half cari- glasses. of sherry no, 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 and no, 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 I'm caricaturing it. I'm caricaturing <laughs> it, but I'm sure in the home counties, they're likewise all sitting there with their Prosecco, drinking a little bit more at the beginning of a relationship, but yeah. perhaps a little bit yeah, less a bit later. And at the point that you drink a little bit less, you've got less of the rose tinted glasses and mm. you're looking at someone who you're not proseccoed out of your head and well so- how many people self-medicate through their marriage you know <clears throat> come in pop open a bottle of wine every single night to be able to yeah. bear the person opposite them. Yeah, yeah, then yeah. Uh, will be able to bear to hear or say something that they're feeling within the relationship and then to end up having a sort of I mean, half pissed uh, argument about it you know so how many of us are really communicating anyway see know? but I would go so far as to say I think in the end pre-marriage counselling it's a tricky one because you can do all of that pre-marriage because people are being bought it for their weddings. It's like becoming a, a wedding gift. Yeah, here, here you go. Have I some know, pre-marriage ca- counselling. It's really weird because I'm torn in two ways because in one part of me absolutely loves this mm. and would say, yeah, go ahead and do it with a young person. But we are, we are adult teenagers and it's the rebellious self in us and that, you know, that that lack of will to let go of that. We're still talking about that. Yeah, but what about the first days of love? And that should be everything and that should be enough. We're still actually not letting go of that. We're seeing the alternative that as boring and sensible and, you know, and, 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 and I think there's got to be a middle ground in that. Yeah, no, I agree. But I think relationships change and shift slowly like a glacier. Mm. You know, and I think you that's... Can't pre- you can't predict. And also you can't... But what about if you know then? OK, you can't predict, but you think, OK, we've been... I mean, we were very odd because it was all whirlwind, but we've been together two years, OK? Somebody's yeah. been together two years, this was, which is the most often length of time for an engagement, I think it's a couple of years and then they right. get married. So you're a couple of years into your yeah. engagement. You still really love this person. You're still in love with this person. But there are things that are starting to go a little bit... God, it really annoys me the way he always... Oh, God, it's... I didn't realise she was... She thought that. Mm. Or she's, wouldn't that be good advice to just go and get somebody to help you communicate with that stuff rather than papering over the cracks? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it all comes down to whether you are willing to put in... You know, you either fall into the camp of thinking a relationship is about, you know, instinct and emotion and, and you know, uh, what's it called? You know, when it, it, it's spontaneity and you're just feeling stuff. And then recognising that at some point it's not going to be about those things. It's mm-hmm. like, I, you will often have that sort of discussion where I go, oh, we just want it to be a bit like it used to be. And it's like, well, we both look at each other as grown people in their 50s, nearly 50s, saying, well, it can't always be like that. And then you sort of think, well, it'd be nice to have it for a moment. And then when you have it for a moment, you're kind of having to manufacture that moment. Let's go away, let's go and do that. You're not having it. You're having to kind of programme it. You're having to schedule it. You don't... So relationships change. So I think this idea that pre-marriage counselling is going to resolve essentially the shift of age, the shift of time. I don't think it's saying that. I think what it's saying is that it, I, I think at its absolute base level, what, it's gonna, what, what it will be trying to say is keep the lines of communication open so you can get through the bumps in the road. Mm. The bumps in the roads are going to be there. We can't make a, we can't make a smooth pathway because mm. what would be the point of that anyway? I mean, a good long-term relationship is about as much about the bumps in the road yeah. as the high, the highs and the lows are it. And I suppose if they're just giving you tools to navigate your way through the trickier times, mm. then that's good. I right? mean, I think one of the things that they do do in pre-marriage counselling is they talk you through the likely hurdles you're going to hit. Right. So, like, the pressures of that's having... A bit, it's going to be a bit depressed. So, like, I mean, but the problem is, is I think if I was given a sort of very academic sit-down, let's have a chat about what you're going to face, and you know, I probably wouldn't have had a relationship. But I thought, fuck, that, I know, that sounds it's like weird. a nightmare. We're probably actually the wrong people to talk about this subject. Yeah, just just because we both think two alike. Now, now, if you were <clears> with one of your exes, I'm thinking of one in very particular, this would be such a different conversation wouldn't it because some people really do want that order they want to know what's happening in the order where we are both 
two Scorpios, two chaotic souls that came together in this terrible mess I just say, I and think then made it people. work. I don't think that's what most people are. I think more, more people I think more people are much more considered. We weren't considered. I don't if agree. you look at us on paper, we should not have done no, what no, we no, did no, no, at all. I think not... the vast majority of relationships that happen are are explosions of <laughs> that happens. And then what people do is they life raft each other. Yeah, life raft each other. They life raft each other and they sort of think, well, well this, that's is, a the good be- analogy. this is the best rafting. thing that I've got. This is, you know, maybe. he likes me enough. I'm not, I'm not going to get more. But maybe that's what the pre-marriage counselling is. Then it just throws some rafts out where you kind of know where they're going to be in the distance if this thing should come up. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm looking at it as a sort of... You know, my worry is, is that can you legislate against We're looking emotions? at it from a romantic point of view. Well, romantic realism, that's the phrase yeah. that's driving me nuts. No, well, don't think about romantic realism. I think we both... I'm thinking of some of those relationships that we've been around, young relationships, where they're so polite with each other. But we are We're very formal. impulsive people. Like we are say, would you like a kiss? Yes, would you mind putting your arm around me? Mm, that would be really nice. Would you like to go out for a romantic evening? Oh, that sounds really nice, Giles. I mean, Mark, what? you've got to stop this Giles it's not thing. not Giles, it's Tarquin normally. I know, but Giles. whatever it is, don't say people's names. No, 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 but what I'm saying is, is that there's that sort of... I think you can get to the point where you overthink everything and it... I but just, some people have comfort in that sort of relationship. It wouldn't be yeah, the relationship no, no, right for, for you. I'm not saying I don't want... It wouldn't want, be the relationship no. for me, but for a lot of people, that's, that's a comfortable place. And you know what? Maybe that's maybe actually we wouldn't have so much anxiety. Maybe if we were a bit more like that, you know, we are we are an extremely anxious couple. We live in a state no, no. within our so relationship. We are very very anxious. We make each and other we make anxious. our children anxious by osmosis. Just our by dogs being, are anxious. Just by being around us, we are. Our dog, we've got anxious dogs because we live in this state of like. I mean, you know, anxiety. I was watching, I was watching one of our vlogs the other day and I said to you, didn't I? Because I don't usually watch them and I was like, I sort of scan a bit through them because I can't bear to watch them. I scan through them so I can answer the questions. But I actually sat down and watched it and I, I, and I said to you, didn't I? I said, why would anyone watch this? No, I don't know. We are in a We're constant... We are intolerable. We are at volume 10, intensity 10, mm. anxiety to, uh, all the time and... And yes, we sit in a vlog, but that is what we are like all the time. Where's the quiet moments? Where's the considered moments? Where's the actually just sitting and really talking to each other? We are just like... Di, 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 di. And I, I do find it exhausting, and you find it exhausting. I'd say everyone else in the house has a natural leaning towards times of quietude, and you don't. Oh, if you do this now, right, we're going to fall out on the podcast. <laughs> do not... Dare do that? No, I mean within the pod, within the no. vlogs and everything. We're no, all, we're you are, all... I'm not having that, Mark. You're on high anxiety alert all the time. You're on anti-anxiety pills for God's sake, and you're still shaking anxious. your camera, and you're still anxious. Hmm? Don't you try and make out to me that you're the quiet one? I'm not saying I'm we've the gone quiet off, one. We've gone off piece. I'm not here. saying I'm the quiet. One. Okay, so seven year itch, twelve year itch. Is that when? When is the next itch coming that we need to worry about? Well, how long have we been married? Sixteen years. 17 years we've been together, 16 years married. I don't think it's about when's the next itch. When's I think, the next incoming itch? I think that we have... I think because we're both always on, switched on, and I think because we're seven-day-a-weekers, we, we work a lot on social media as well as our other jobs. I don't know. I think our relationship needs a day a week with no phones on and I think we both fear that absolutely equally and I think that we if we were to go to counselling now I think that's what I would try and be brave enough to say to the counsellor I would say you need to help us find our way through where we are digitally switched off for a day a week because I think and I think this is the case for so many relationships I think that's an entire where we're podcast. digitally where we're digitally um, a distance. No, but I'm, I'm getting to the point of this because I think, I wonder if why there's this rise in young people looking for this is because they've grown up with this digital world mm. and the technological distance. When we got together, we 
I hardly ever went on my phone. I know. I didn't even well, go on a computer until five years ago. I do think this is an entire podcast, actually. No, no, but, but the way, I'm just no, but the way technology about... is killing relationships, and you're right, this yeah. could be a reason why there's a there's a rise in pre-marriage yeah, counselling. Yeah, I, think it, I really reach, do think it... It's almost like it, the idea of having guidance and chat and talk with a mediator is analogue. <laughs> it's yeah, an analogue thought. Yeah, because when you thought. think about when we were first in a relationship, however yeah. chaotic yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. we went out... We hung out. Yeah. We never looked at our phone. And people we, spending we didn't an have awful Instagram. Lot of time. No. We didn't. Sorry, yeah. we, had to, we had to do an edit there because Nadia's phone, phone stopped. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. We didn't have emails so coming. So work in. didn't interrupt us all the time. I mean, oh my god, I feel like I'm having an epiphany that, that developed, right here, right now. No, that was in the middle of running. Uh, you know, Doghouse Media at its height was there was a transition where you started to get emails at home and commissioners and everyone. Could yeah, we remember we used to be really shocked. Oh my yeah. god, we're getting an email. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we. Our, Slow erosion. We have a relationship. We have a more intense, and I'm not. It's really, really complicated. It's very, very complicated. And I think I'm not going off topic here because I think we might have hit on why young people are having to do this. This is how they've grown into their relationship. Well, at least we had that communication to begin with. We've lost it. We've lost a lot of it because we are plugged into, mm. and because work is so demanding. Mm. I mean. You have to work the amount that you do on your computer and you're on your phone and your but we have to find I hate that saying a safe space without any technology. Mm. And I I really do predict a riot that if we don't do something about that fairly soon, like in the new year, I think we should really think about it and give us ourselves time, you know, nine o'clock that phone goes off yeah. or whatever. I think that's will be amazing for would our you, relationship. Would you give our daughters advice? Oh, I know what, what I wanted to say. In the old days, you would have got out Watch of the, the car. Table, you're really you would have got it. out of a car. I would have got out of a car. We'd have sat and waited. We'd have looked at each other. And talked? No, no. When you got out of the car and walked away. Oh, I, I was see. thinking about this the other day because I didn't have my phone. And actually watched you and I thought, we don't do that anymore. No. Young people never do that. They well, never don't, watch. No, well, no, the what you wouldn't go, do, you wouldn't look along a railway platform to see someone arriving and look out for them. What you'd wait, what you'd wait for is you'd look at your phone and wait for wait a text, text saying, "I'm on the platform." Little details like that. Like but, things like that. We should meet up and we should say, "Well, I'll meet you at such and such," and then not and know that we're not going to do it again by the phone. We should have wait. dates. We should have analog dates. <gasps> analog dates. I'm scared. But your baby, you would never make it because you don't know how to find anywhere. Mind you, you don't have to use Google Maps. Do you always have to make me out to be a total tit? No, I mean, with geography, you don't have to get I'm anywhere. Bad with geography. I mean, you can't cross roads and you don't know where you're going because you're always jumping in cars. Um, other people's cars, by the way. Um, would you recommend our daughters to go to pre marriage counselling? I think I probably I would. I think, having just stumbled upon why I think so many people are, and I think it's because. Yeah, I probably would because mm. they don't get to hang out and just communicate. <coughs> Everything's through the bloody phone. Okay, well, pre-marriage counsellors say these are the five top reasons why pre-marriage counselling is good for you. Pre-marriage counselling, number one, pre-marriage counselling can teach you how to talk to each other. Number two, pre-marriage counselling can explain why you chose each other in the first place. Number three, you can learn about what events in the journey of your relationship are likely to test you. And that's an interesting one because... Not just, not just having babies, but deaths in the family. Because, you know, when parents of either partner die, it can change relationship. I know well, a relationship. When parents get elderly. Well, and also, yeah, exactly, the whole, um, what's it called, uh, sandwich generation. Mm. But I remember a relationship where the husband ended up leaving his wife because she couldn't ever get over the loss of her father. It just changed irrevocably sure their was. relationship. Nice man. Yeah. Um, f well, no, but that was after... Years and years, it just changed her. So the relationship yeah, but she's obviously had some sort of depression. No, I agree. In sickness agree. and in health. In sickness and in health. Uh, number four, you will learn how to resolve disagreements. And there's a, there's a really sort of again these phrases. This is dangerously, you know, right on, brother. Because what you can put in within these moments within relationship therapy is a behaviour change request. A behaviour change request. Oh, can we do a whole I'm podcast? I'm putting on in behavior a change. behaviour change request. So I wonder whether, like on a football pitch, you hold up, hold aloft like a referee, a yellow card. Or oh, do you remember at one point in our relationship when we were absolutely desperate and I said, we need a red card. Yeah. I need a card to say, not now, and you need a yellow card. And we, we were seriously... Did we not get a card? I got... No, you got a referee's whistle and the shorts and you'd wear them on a Friday. 
Anyway, um, but anyway, no, but you, you know, but you could put and well, hang on. Number oh. five, you get to express. Your, but the other side of it all is, you also get to express your feelings of love and affection for your partner, because I think that's a really key thing. Is that sometimes one of the things about counselling that we you rarely talk about? You talk about conflict resolution. You talk about being heard and getting your side across. But also sometimes, and I would say this is actually something quite a problem between me and you, is that you put up so many barriers in a very different way to me in terms of being able to show affection. I know we've talked a lot in other podcasts about the showing of affection. And I found counselling a really safe place to open up vulnerably to how much I want to show that affection to you so that I can actually say to you, you know, so I think it's interesting to think of a counselling scenario, not just about solving problem one, solving problem two, solving problem three, but also actually it's an opportunity to amplify to your feelings and to, and to show more emotion. Um, I, I think I might have mentioned this in another podcast, I can't remember, but I love, <clears throat> I love watching my uh, crappy American shows and one of the ones that I like is this marriage boot camp mm. place. And one of the... One of the exercises they get them to do is they have to they have they have a chapel and then their husband or wife is in the coffin, open coffin. Wow. And they have to write a sort of obituary. Yeah. Or a eulogy. Yeah. I can't remember. Do they write it beforehand or do they have to wow. No, that's it. They have to come in and see them dead wow. and then they have to say to them. And oh my god, it it the most extraordinary things happen and are said at these wow. it's really powerful and i'm just thinking about recently we went to a funeral and um and the uh our friend said to us wow what isn't this an amazing turnout hey let's all not let's not all wait until we're dead before yeah. we do this for each other yeah. and that that's really resonated with me i keep thinking about that and i and i think of nanny thelma and how the funeral when all the people that were there was what she wanted mm. all her life mm. and I think that's a really good thing to keep thinking of if that if that person wasn't there maybe you could do that in premarital counselling what would you, write your partner's obituary it's a bit mm. dark write it because you could have it in black and white mm. and then when times are really difficult you look back and go this is what I love about you this is what I'd miss about you this would be the worst thing on earth if you weren't here I've just identified a major flaw with the entire concept of oh, pre-marriage counselling pre-marriage counselling pre you don't necessarily know all the problems that the other partner has about them you probably don't necessarily know everything about your partner. No, but it would deal with the ones that partner. you do. Of course, you can't predict everything. It's going to deal with the ones that you do already have a problem with. Well, rather than walking and going, oh, well, I really hate it when he does mm. this, but just going to keep my fingers crossed and I hope it's fine. Mm. What do you think, guys? Pre-marriage counselling? Like is, Ameri- is it an American crackpot idea or is it, is it something that's, that's, that's I really sensible? I like it again now. We started off with I one. know. I feel like I've gone bust down, left, right. You know, it's, at least it's distracted me from the leak in the ceiling, which is good. Well, I wish you hadn't brought up the leak in the ceiling because yeah. I've been worrying about I'm gonna it. I'm going to go out on a stepladder and I'm going to in- oh, in- inspect. Babe, you're not good on stepladders. No, I know. Anyway, pray for him. L- listen, guys. Subscribe on iTunes. Like 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 if you don't like just don't like it don't put anything just go and watch and listen some, to something else or as he always says to me wish they would just like it even if they don't like it yeah would you just <laughs> like it you know? jesus anyway guys lots of love oh, tell us your thoughts care. down below bye, bye.